finished book. Um, and we're going to continue with where we left off. Wow, it's been months now, hasn't it been? Do you even do you, do you even remember? It's been a while, hasn't it? I had to go back and, and uh, do some review and refreshing even for myself because we've been looking at some other things. But we continue this morning. Acts, God's unfinished book. I'm not going to give you a handout this morning, but I will give you one next week that catches you up from this week and then goes into next week as well. Uh, this is going to be uh, continuing. Uh, we're going to kind of stop midway uh, on the topic this morning. We're going to pick it up next week again. But this morning, we're going to have just a brief uh, review sort of in the middle as we continue. And we look this morning beyond Jerusalem. Up to this point, the church, the Christians, We've only seen them in Jerusalem, where Jesus said, you wait here, and in a few days, the Father and I, were going to send the promise, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is where they were, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts, the ends of the earth, the ends of the earth. There's a place in, in, in China that's called the end of the earth, or the ends of the ends of the earth, and some of us have been there before. And... Up to this point, we've only seen the church in Jerusalem. Hasn't gone any further than that. But something is going to happen, as we looked last time, something happens from this point onward in the book of Acts that pushes the church out from Jerusalem, which is where the blessing of the Lord came. Always be thankful for a happy child, even when they're loud. Amen? Amen. We're happy. Amen. We, we really are. We mean it. Caleb's a cheerful little baby, right, Pastor Fayez? Yes, he is. He's a cheerful <laughs> little baby. Amen. My mother says that I was a loud baby as well, but I was not a happy baby. <laughs> Mom says I cried for a year after I was born. I think I had colic. I know. I guess I translated that into preaching, right? <laughs> she said I had colic for a year, and I was not, ha not nice to be around. But anyhow, I hope I'm nicer now to be around. But we see the church with what happens, with something terrible that happens, being thrust out of Jerusalem into further and further areas. And we're going to look at that today and then go on. But today we're going to look at a little bit more at saints, sinners, and a sorcerer. And next week we're going to look at the sorcerer just a little bit more because you say, well, hey, Pastor Jennifer, I'd prefer not to look at sorcerers. Let's look at good, let's look at good things only and good people only. But there are things in this passage in chapter 8 that are helpful to you and to me as Christians in this world where there is more and more in this area and Jesus said to his disciples and he says to us that in the last days there will be more of this and so without spending a whole lot of time on it we're going to look a little bit this week and then next week as well and how we how we discern and how how we know what to do as we go through these things so we're going to look at saints, sinners, and a sorcerer. Three very vividly drawn characters in this chapter, uh, end, of, end of chapter 7 going into chapter 8. We've already met Stephen, uh, who was a man full of faith. So we'll go ahead and look at slide 2. Um, who, a man who was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And as we look at him, uh, we have no idea what Stephen looked like, okay? But anyhow... This is the picture I found on Google Images, okay? So just imagine. I, I, I like to use pictures. It helps us, it helps us to, to imagine. If you imagine Stephen another way, that's fine. We'll find out in heaven, but we're all going to be different then anyhow. But we've met Stephen, and actually externals are not important, are they? What's important is what we see of Stephen, his character, his Christian life. And the most important thing that we have found out about Stephen is that he was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit. That is, man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and specifically, underline, underline, full of the Holy Spirit. The number one characteristic of this first martyr of the Christian church. We see that he was that the Holy Spirit, and, and I like to say when I talk about the Holy Spirit, I like to say God the Holy Spirit. So often you'll hear me say God the Holy Spirit because we so often uh, talk, we always often um, put the Holy Spirit in a box and talk about Him as an experience or an it or a feeling or power or whatever. We have power through the Holy Spirit. We can experience his presence with us 
and all of these things, but He is God. He is God. He's God the Holy Spirit. And we see God the Holy Spirit with Stephen as he was in the very beginning, in this part, when he was just waiting on tables, doing nothing more spiritual than serving food to people faithfully. And as we've said before, we so often, you know, we think about being Christians and we think, well, um, to do what Pastor Jennifer does or Pastor Renee does, to do what Brother Stephen or Brother Chris or, or Sister Panina, what they do when they're leading worship. Now, you really got to be full of the Holy Spirit. But these other things, you know, I... I I got that. I can handle that. And the Bible is very clear for each one of us. The work of God, the things that He calls us to do in His body, the everyday things, really, the everyday things, greeting at the, at the door, working in the, in the tech, um, serving, cleaning, all of these things, it's part of the church of God. It's part of the family of God. And He wants us to be equipped and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do this. Amen? And so we see God the Holy Spirit with Stephen as he does that. We see God the Holy Spirit with Stephen as his ministry begins to grow from waiting on tables to defend, proclaiming and defending the Word of God and signs and wonders being performed. Is it because Stephen was so great? No. It's because Stephen was faithful to God and the Holy Spirit had filled him. And this was really, this was the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit's work in your life and in my life will always take us beyond what we can do ourselves. And that's why the Bible is so clear. Be full of the Holy Spirit. Every one of us. Not a denominational thing. It's for every one of us. And then we see God, the Holy Spirit, with Stephen. And we see Stephen also as he comes to that point where the whole Sanhedrin is in front of him. And they're raging against him. And persecution is, is upon him. And you know, Stephen wasn't a dummy. Stephen knew, Stephen knew he wasn't going to get out of this alive. He knew that. He knew that he was going to give his life. But here's this beautiful, beautiful picture for you and for me this morning as we look at Stephen. In the midst of rage and hatred, bitter opposition against him, and all of this persecution, the Holy Spirit enabled Stephen to look above it and in the midst of that to see Jesus. Amen? To see Jesus. And I hope you see that and get that this morning because you and I go through hard times. You and I go through storms. You and I go through tr troubles and persecution. But when the Holy Spirit has control of our lives, He will help us to look above and beyond and over those things that seem to overwhelm us, whether it is physical, health-related, financial, interpersonal relations, relationships, any of these things. The Holy Spirit in us helps us see Jesus. And that's why it says in Hebrews, we fix our eyes on Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the crown. And so the only way we can really fix our eyes on Jesus is with the help of the Holy Spirit. But when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we're going to make it through. Sometimes we think we're not going to make it. Have you ever thought you weren't going to make it? Yeah, me too. I too. When we see Jesus, we're going to make it. When we see Jesus, we're going to make it. And so we see Stephen and the Holy Spirit equipped equipping him, empowering him as he goes through this. And then we come to this last picture that we see of Stephen, and I love this one as well, because as they are throwing the stones at him, Stephen shouts through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. And for this speaks to me also because we see here again the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a saint, and may I say something to you this morning? You're a saint too. I'm a saint too. And here's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives in the same way as it was in Stephen's life. The Holy Spirit enabled Stephen to forgive. To forgive. To forgive those who were harming him. To forgive, those, to forgive them as they were hurting him and persecuting him and bringing about his death. 
And Stephen was able to say, oh God, forgive, don't charge this sin. Because you see, if the Lord charged his death to their account, there would be no hope for them. They would have been murderers. They were going to hell. I, I mean it. I, I'm not trying to be shocking. That if they were charged with that, they were going to hell. That was it. And Stephen says, in, in grace and in mercy and in the love of Jesus, oh, don't charge them with this sin. The Holy Spirit helps us to forgive people. Now, I don't know about you. It may just be your pastor that sometimes has a hard time forgiving. I sometimes have a hard time forgiving people. Do you? I say, Lord, I forgive them, and it comes back to my mind again. You do the same thing, don't you? We all do because of our humanness, because of our humanness. The Holy Spirit will help you forgive people, and he'll set you free from those things. And I don't know about you, but oh, I need that work of the Holy Spirit in my life. You do too. You do too. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He will. And you may say, it's hard. You better believe it's hard. But, but he does it. And he can. And you know why he can? Because he's God. Because he's God. He helps us. He doesn't want us to stay in a prison of bitterness and unforgiveness. He helps set us free because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. And Jesus said, I have come to set prisoners free, to release from bondage, to release from captivity. All of that was the work of Jesus. And it was carried out, it is carried out, and fulfilled in the lives of Christians today through the inner dwelling and working of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so there's our brother Stephen, a saint. Um, I mentioned it before, but I want to remind you again, as we look at Stephen, I'm so glad that Lighthouse Stephen um, added the song. We didn't sing it in the first service. We sang it in the second service. Bring forth the royal diadem. There are two words in the Bible, in the New Testament, two Greek words for, for crown. And one of them is diadem. It's a crown. And a crown, uh, the diadem is one that is given, the one that is owned by right. By right. And that's one of the crowns that Jesus has. It's the diadem that is his. Um, and it is by right. Uh, by authority. The other diadem is called Stephanos. And from that Greek word we have the name Stephen. And that is also a crown, but it is the crown of victory. Isn't that encouraging? It's the crown of victory, and it is the crown that is... You too, Big Steve. It is the... He says, me, me, me. His wife looked at him and went like that. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's a good reminder, isn't it? It's a good reminder. And it is the crown, listen, brothers and sisters, it is the crown that is available and is promised to every single one of us when we overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony and we love not our lives unto death. It is the crown of which Paul spoke when he said, I have run the race, I have finished the course, I've kept the faith, I've fought the good fight, and now there is a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me. And then he says, and to all of those. That's to us, brothers and sisters. And one day, you and I are going to meet Stephen in heaven, because we're going to make it, aren't we? Because the Holy Spirit's going to help us make it, and we're saying yes to him. One day we're going to meet Stephen, and along with Stephen, we're going to take our crowns of victory because we've made it. And we're going to lay them at the feet of the one who helped us make it. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So that's Stephen. Now let's meet a sinner. Okay, you say, ooh. Yeah, let's meet a sinner for just a little bit. And let's look at the next one. Let's look at Saul here. Notice his name's not Paul yet. Um, his name is still Saul, and this is from Acts 7, 8, and 9. And this is just a short vignette um, of Stephen in these early chapters. Uh, sorry, of Saul in these early chapters. Let me just give you a little uh, footnote or a little PS here just a minute. God is the author of the Bible, but he uses human people to transcribe. And human people have human characteristics. That's why when you serve the Lord, when you work for the Lord, when you do things for the Lord, God infuses you and empowers you, but you're still you. And, and what you do for him is still going to have some of your characteristics. So Luke is writing the Gospel of Luke and also uh, the book of Acts. And Luke does something that uh, some of the other writers don't do as much. Luke will often, in the early chapters, he'll write just a few verses about someone then you don't read anymore until way later in the book you go, oh, there he is again. 
For example, Barnabas. Remember we met Barnabas already? But, now, but where's Barnabas right now? We're not going to meet Barnas, Barnabas again for several more chapters. Same thing with Philip, but we're going to meet Philip this morning because he's going to be one of our saints. And Saul right now. And then Saul's, we're not going to see Saul again for, for, oh, quite a little bit, and then we're going to see Saul again. So Luke does this, and as we look at Saul, uh, let's look at his character. He seems to be a, a young hothead. That's, that's one of the nicest things we can say about him, isn't it? His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. Here when it says young man, it means between 20 and 40 years of age. But a lot of Bible scholars believe that Saul was probably about 30 years old, which was about the age of most of the disciples of Jesus as well, the followers of Jesus. Um, when it says they took off their coats and laid them, most of us know it didn't mean, hey, hold my bag while I do this. What it meant was Saul was in charge of this. Saul was leading the mob. Sa Saul was the the boss, sort of the director and the instigator. Second verse, Saul was one of the witnesses and he agree agreed completely with the killing of Stephen, which to me is a little bit amazing when you think about it because as we've talked about before, a stoning was one of the, to me, one of the most gruesome deaths possible. It, it, could, be, it could be quite slow and agonizing, extremely painful and very personal, and very personal because it was my stone thrown at a person and you would see that stone that you threw hit that person and knock him down or or or, or it was a terrible thing but Stephen agreed uh, sorry Saul agreed completely with it then the third one Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church he went from house to house dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison and the language there describes a wild animal that's that's mangling and eating its prey that's what Saul was doing to the church and then that last verse Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Have you ever been eager to do something before? What are we eager? I'm eager to do this. I'm eager to meet someone. Imagine having the temperament or the personality or the whatever at that moment to be eager to kill. That was Saul. That was Saul. But I want to say something to you morning, this morning as you're all kind of looking at me, sort of shell-shocked as we look at this man who became the more than any other follower of Christ influenced the church of God. Brothers and sisters, we don't see it now, but you and I are going to get to heaven one day and we're going to see how much of our DNA has come from this man. Really, how much of our DNA, all of us have it in, it, in, uh, in us. But I want to encourage you this morning. We already know the end of this story and we know that Saul is going to become Paul and he's a sinner who's going to become a saint. Now, you have unfinished stories in your life. I have unfinished stories in my life, in my family, loved ones and friends. There are some sinners in, my, in the bunch. There's some sinners in the bunch of people that I'm around, and you too. And frankly, sometimes I feel like I'm in that group, and you probably do as well. I want you to be encouraged this morning by Saul because God was able to take a Saul and make him into Paul, a sinner, and make him into a saint. Our God is the Alpha and the? The beginning, the first, and the last. Let God have the last word in the stories of your lives in your own story. If you fall, get up and keep going. Don't give up on yourself because God's not giving up on you. If there are people, friends, and family in your lives that you've pray, been praying for and you think, I'm giving up, I can't believe they're so terrible, keep on. Let God have the last word. Let God have the last word. We see it with Saul and we can see it in our own lives as well. And so there's Saul, this sinner. And then we go into this transition and we find pivot points throughout the book of Acts. The day of Pentecost was one. And here's another pivot point as well because it says as we look at Acts 8.1, on that day a great persecution 
Why does Luke say a great persecution? Because there had already been other persecutions, right? Uh, the apostles had been arrested. They'd been, at, they'd been beaten. Some things had happened. But it wasn't a great persecution. This was a great persecution. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. When it says all were scattered, it doesn't mean that every single one of them except 12. But what it means is by and large, the church was scattered. Okay? They were scattered outside of Jerusalem. The apostles, uh, the apostles stayed there. And so as we get to this point, we've talked a little bit about it, but I want us to think about it just a little bit more. If you and I had been there at that point, we would have had questions. And you say, no, Pastor Jennifer, of course we see what God is doing. Fooey. <laughs> we look with hindsight. We look with 2020 vision. And we say, see, God was doing something wonderful and so forth and so on. But you and I are human. And because we're human, we go through really difficult things and hard things and seeming defeats of the devil. Uh, sorry, seeming defeats of God in our lives. Let me put it that way. And we see things that happen at times that we think is a victory of the devil. Uh, the, the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. When all the world thought, he's lost. The other side has won. We look at this and we have questions about it just as we have questions in our own lives at times when things like this happen. And I, I pause on this point and I want to encourage us this morning because we look at this and we say, why God? Just as we say, why God in our own lives, don't we? I've said, why God in my life before? Why did you let this happen? You didn't have to let it happen. You're God. You could have changed it. You could have made the outcome different. You could have delivered me. You could have this, you could have that. Yes, he could have. And the devil brings things into our lives. He does. So I'm sorry, for me, I don't agree with the doctrine or the theology that if you're a Christian, that nothing bad's going to happen to you, that everything's going to be okay, just declare victory and whatever. And the reason I don't agree with that is because the Bible shows us otherwise, right? The Bible shows us otherwise. There's a theology of suffering that is in the Bible, that is in the Bible. It's part, that's part of the Christian experience. But we look at this and I'm encouraged because I see that the devil did something. Saul was, Saul's rage was fueled by hell. Saul's rage was fueled by the devil, full of hatred. But God was big enough to take what the devil had done and bend it to his purposes in that situation and bring something good. And so I say to us this morning, that in our lives, God is able to take the hard things of your life, the difficult things, the seeming defeats, the seeming victories of the enemy, and in his hands, bend them for good purposes for you. That's the type of God he is. He loves you, and he's a good God. He loves me, and he's a good God. I would do it differently. You would do it differently, wouldn't we? We'd all do it differently at times. But God is God, and He can bring good, and He can use the hardest thing, the sharpest arrow, the deepest cut, and bring something good. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, we're going to skip one of the slides. And uh, we see that as they began to go, this pivotal point as the per persecution spread out, uh, as the persecution spread in Jerusalem, uh, it began to do something to the church. Satan's attempt was to stamp out the fire. Have you ever tried to stamp out a fire before? A real fire. Usually what happens when you try to stamp out a fire? Whoosh, sparks fly, right? And I love this picture because really, in effect, that's what happened. Satan tries to stamp out the fire of the church and the sparks begin to fly. And we see in Acts 4 that those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And here's this beautiful picture I want to remind you of this morning. Those who had been scattered. The word scattered here is a farming word and it means it's the same word uh, that would be used if a farmer went out into the field. We're all, we don't have so many farmers here, but the farmer would go out into the field, and this is how they used to, this is how they used to sow seed in those days. And they would take it and they would scatter the seed. That's why Jesus tells the parable of the sower, right? A uh, sower went out to sow, and some seed fell on good ground, and some seed fell here, and some seed fell here. Why? 
because farmers sowed seed by broadcast, by throwing the seed. And here's this beautiful picture of God's people and God's children. Rather than being stamped out, they are scattered like seed. But what happens to seed when it's scattered? It takes root and it grows and it produces fruit. And here we see God's plan at work. And here it says they preached the word wherever they went. And that word preached does not mean to do what I'm doing this morning as I stand before you or what a Sunday school teacher does in a class. That word meant that as they went and as they were scattered, they spoke about Jesus. They talked about Jesus. They lived like Jesus. They shared the love of Jesus. They were Jesus' representatives as they went. That's what that word preached meant. And that encourages me, and that should encourage you as well. You heard Janice talk about lifestyle evangelism. That's what it is right there in Acts 8, chapter 4. Now, one of those scattered uh, was another saint that we're going to meet this morning, and we're going to meet Philip. You say, oh, Philip the apostle. No, not Philip the apostle. Philip the waiter. Philip the the deacon, just as Stephen was. Philip was one of those. He was a Jew, but he was uh, a Jew influenced by Greek culture, and he was full of faith also, and he was waiting on the tables. So Philip is scattered, and he is scattered where? Let's look. Next verses. Philip went down to a city in Samaria. Stop. <laughs> okay, stop right there. Philip went down to a city in Samaria. Now, if I were to ask you, where's the last place on earth you would want to go, you'd probably, you could probably name a place, right? But don't, name, but don't name it, because God loves the people in that place, wherever it is. And God has a plan for the people, and whatever that place is that you don't want to go. But Philip went down to Samaria. Now, why do I say stop right there? Because Samaria was a place that no good Jew wanted to go. If you were traveling throughout Israel, and you were in Jerusalem, you had three ways to go if you were going to go, going from here to here, say to Galilee or whatever. So, so let's say that Samaria is, here's Jerusalem, here's Samaria, and then maybe Galilee as Jesus and his disciples. There was one way that was this way, there was one way that, that was this way, and then there was one way through Samaria. Well, good Jews went this way or this way. They didn't go to Samaria. Why? Because the Samaritans were a bunch of pagans. They were. They had taken the worship of God. It had been mixed with idol worship because they had intermarried with other races. Hundreds of years earlier, they'd been, they had been uh, um, conquered by other lands and, and people of other nations had been brought in and they'd been moved. And as they intermarried, uh, other cultural practices and other religions were brought in. It was just a mix. In fact, it was so bad that when the Jews had left Babylon and had gone back to rebuild the temple, they were so mixed that when the Samaritans came to the Jews and said, hey, let us rebuild the temple of God with you. Do you know what the Jews said? No. And would not let them help rebuild the temple. Well, made the Samaritans mad. And they said, fine, you build your temple, we'll go build our own temple. And the Samaritans built their own temple, but they set up idolatry in the temple of God as well. So Jews hated Samaritans, Samaritans hated Jews. And this is where Philip went. And I love it because when the Holy Spirit has control of our lives, brothers and sisters, and when the Holy Spirit fills us, these barriers that we have these prejudices that each one of us has. Each one of us has prejudice. You say, oh, no, not I. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. We all do. We all do because, and, and every once in a while, something will come up and we'll think, oh, I didn't know that was in me. I didn't know I felt that way. We all have them. But the Holy Spirit deals with those things. And Philip goes to Samaria, and what does he do? He proclaimed the Christ there. And when the crowds, look at this carefully, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all played, paid close attention to what he said. Here's a beautiful picture and a pattern for us. I don't know if any church growth seminars are doing this or not, but here's a pretty good pattern as well. They heard what he was saying and they saw what was happening. A message can be 100% truth, but if it is powerless, 
and there's no anointing and conviction of the Holy Spirit, and if there is no love displayed, it touches no heart and it changes no one. That's why the Holy Spirit has to get hold of our lives and we have to say yes to Him because the Holy Spirit's going to fill us with the love of Jesus. The Holy Spirit's going to make us want to reach people, not just you're a sinner and you need Jesus, but our hearts will ache with, oh, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to go to hell. Receive the offer of life. Receive the love of Jesus and live and live. That's what the Holy Spirit will do when He's in our hearts and that, that will be our hearts as well. And so Philip preaches, and it's a message of truth, but it's also a demonstration of power. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And it takes both. And you say, well, oh, I don't know if that happens in my uh, miraculous signs. Well, I'm not. And, and evil spirits coming out and paralytics and cripples being healed. I will grant you that these signs and miraculous things are not as common in, how can I say it, in very educated areas or societies. I want to say it in the right way. What I have seen is, as the, and heard, is that most of the time, as, the, as often as the Word of God goes forth into new areas. The Holy Spirit works and moves powerfully and confirms His Word with signs such as these. And it convinces hearts and it breaks things open. Holy Spirit has to do that. Now, can the Holy Spirit do that in our society? Sure He can. He's the Holy Spirit. But remember what Jesus said? Many times the work of God and the work of the Holy Spirit is limited by what people will allow and by what people will believe. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. But we see this beautiful work of the Holy Spirit that is powerful, loving, and truthful. And wonderful things are happening. Um, paralytics and cripples were healed. Shrieks, evil spirits come out. And we look at that and we think, well, that's kind of like Stephen. That's kind of like Jesus. Yes. Why? Because Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Why? Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Why? Philip was full of the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And then in, in verse 8 it says, So there was great joy in that city. How many of you remember when you first got saved, really saved? Do you remember the joy as you turned from darkness to light? as you were delivered from bondage and came into the family of God of love and acceptance, guilt was gone. Oh, remember the joy? Do you know that one of my prayers has been in recent months, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. You say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, have you been sinning? And you need to be repent and restored? Well, we all sin, but that's not what I've been praying for. I've been praying for a restoration of the joy. I want to be reminded again of, of that joy that I felt when the when the works of God were new and fresh in my life. Luke talks about the joy of salvation and the joy of God in hearts and lives seven different times in the Gospel of Luke and in the, and in the book of Acts as well. And you know what? I think it's something that we can and should pray for because we can get really set in our ways, right? We get it all up here. We know, oh, yeah, 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 God does this and God does that. And we sort of lose that freshness in our hearts again. And I think it honors God and he would be pleased to answer every prayer that says, Oh God, restore the joy of my salvation. Remind me of that as we walk with him with this overflowing of joy. Now I want, to, I want you to look at this as we consider it just a little bit, and then we're going we're gonna, to uh, look at, 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 just a, at just a little bit more. And as we look at this, I want to encourage you, because Philip goes to a place that he wouldn't normally go, and he goes to people that he wouldn't normally fellowship with, and he goes to people who aren't very much like himself. They're, they're very, very different. And I think for us a lot of times when we're trying to reach people, we are much more comfortable reaching people who are similar to us, right? We really are. You know, it's a lot more comfortable. I don't have to, I don't feel awkward. I don't feel or whatever. And God uses us to reach people who are like ourselves. But what I want to say to you is this. The God who left heaven and the comfort of heaven and the glory of heaven came an unfathomable distance to earth to reach people who were broken 
sinful, ungodly, unholy, nothing like Jesus. But he came because we needed him. Don't be limited by just, I'll reach people who are like me. People who are like me, they'll listen to me. Let the Holy Spirit break down barriers and open your eyes to reach people who are nothing like you, who, who are so, so different. You may not be comfortable around them. I wonder how Jesus was when he came to earth. And he lives in us. And he wants to do in us and through us the same thing that he did when he came to earth. And I think we see that with Philip. Now, in this crowd that came, and I'm going to be going, um, I'll be going, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up with more of this next week, but we're going to go just a little bit further. Uh, we're going to, um, we're going to skip another slide. Go into a, a, a slide 9, Acts 8, 9 through 13. Okay, I don't know what Simon the Sorcerer looked like, but this was in the Google images, okay? And, and, and he looks suitably creepy <laughs> to, to, to me. Um, Although, frankly, brothers and sisters, things like this, uh, the Bible is also very clear, th things that come from the enemy, it may often very, mu very well look like an angel of light. It may not look like this at all, but anyhow. In this crowd of people that are responding, it says there was a man named Simon who had been a sorcerer for many years there in this city, and he was amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. I look at this, and I want us to look at it in a biblical context, because we look at it in 20th century, and we think, oh, well, you know, it was like Siegfried and Roy in Las Vegas. You know, he was just a, he was doing magic tricks. You know, he was doing sleight of hand. He was doing, you know, he was doing things. It was for, it was for, uh, it was for um, uh, 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 entertainment and, and, and whatever. That's not what the Bible tells us about Simon the Sorcerer here, and that's not the biblical uh, context here. This is someone, there was power there. There was real power there. Don't be fooled by, oh, it's power. It must be whatever. The devil has power. The enemy has power. So power is not the test. Power is not the, oh, well, it must be. Even Christians sometimes are gullible about this. They, they really, really are. And we see here someone, by the Bible concept, this man had power. Because there was a religious foundation in Samaria, they looked at the power and the things that he did, and they said, oh, it's God. It's because they were deceived. They were deceived. There are two sources of power in this world. We'll talk about this more next week, and I'm going to end on a positive. Huh. <laughs> I'm going to end on a positive note, but let me just say this, and we'll come back to it next week. There are two sources of power. One is from the enemy, one is from God. Hey, brothers and sisters, there's nothing in between. There's no black magic, white magic. You've heard that before, haven't you? There's no uh, bad witch, good witch. Oh, I'm a good witch. You've heard things like that before, right? It's from God or it's not from God. Nothing in between, nothing in between. We'll talk a bit more about this next week. But the people thought this is from God. In fact, what do they say? The great one the power of God, because he had astounded them with his magic. But now, look at the next part. What does it say? As we look at, this, at, at what happens, the people now begin to follow Philip. Why? Because there is a message of truth and a greater power. Let's click to the next part as well. But now the people believed Philip's message of good news. I love this. It's not just, whoo, he's doing something great. They believed the message. That's what God does. Miracles don't alone, signs alone don't save anyone. They don't save anyone. There must be the preaching of the word, the power of truth. There must be. There must be. And so they listen. They believe. They believe. And who else believes? Simon believes. Praise the Lord. It's a revival. <laughs> Simon believes. Well, it could be. Because Saul is going to become Paul. There's one sinner that's going to become a saint. Is another sinner going to, going to become a saint? We're going to find out next week. You already know because you've read chapter 8. But what I want to say is this. There can be initial steps. And we don't. it can look real. It can look right. It can look true. There can be tears that are cried at an altar. And we've done it before. That may, go, that may go no further than tears that are cried at an altar. But time and fruit show the heart. Time and fruit show the heart. Now, 
you say, we're going to end with that? No, we're going to end with this. Give me one or two minutes, and let's end with this. Uh, go to the l l very last slide, Acts 8, 14. We'll end with this, and then we're going to come back and look at Simon the Sorcerer next week. But we're going to end with this this morning. I want you to be encouraged. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had welcomed God's message, they sent Peter and John to them. And I, I want you to be encouraged by this simple little verse because Peter and John are sent. Who would go to Samaria? Not Peter. You know, he's the, he was the most self-righteous of all of the disciples, wasn't he? Of all of the apostles, he was the leader. And he is sent to Samaria, this place. So we see the work of the Holy Spirit. And then who else goes? Here's the other encouragement. Who's the other guy? I shouldn't say guy. Who's the other apostle? John. You know, I think God the Holy Spirit was laughing when he sent, when he prompted John to go. You know why? Because a few years earlier, first of all, Peter and John would have been reluctant companions to Jesus as Jesus said, I've got to go to Samaria, boys. Didn't tell him why. But Jesus knew there was a wicked, sinful, broken woman who was going to be at the well. And the only way she was going to be helped and saved was if Jesus went there to speak to her. So he said, I got to go to Samaria. Oh, Lord. And John, at another time, right around that time as well, Jesus said, okay, John and the other disciples, go into those Samaritan cities, prepare the way I'm coming through. I'm, that you say, where is that? That is in, that is in Luke 9, 54. We'll look, uh, you can look on your own. Don't look right now. Luke 9, 54. He said, Go to those Samaritan cities, prepare the way, tell them Jesus, tell them the Messiah is coming. Tell them Jesus is coming. John and his brother James go to the city. They get to the city, guess what happens? The Samaritans reject him. No, we don't want your Jews. Don't come here. What is the response of John? Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven on them and burn them up? Scratch your head with me. How could they think Jesus would want them to do that, first of all? But how could they have such hearts of hatred towards people that Jesus had come to save and love? And it is John who now goes to the very area that he had said, shall we call down fire from heaven and have them burned up? And instead of fire from heaven to burn them up, as they lay hands on them and pray for them, there is going to be what fire? Holy Spirit fire. Holy Spirit fire that's going to come upon them, fall upon them in the same way it fell upon the disciples. Brothers and sisters, this is the work. This is the transforming work of God the Holy Spirit in your life, in my life, in the life of John, in the life of Peter. We've got to have him in our lives. We must have him in our lives. He will make the difference. Amen? Amen. Amen. When we come back next week, we're going to talk about Simon just a little bit more. But then we're going to talk about some other good things as well. Let's close in prayer very quickly. And let me just pray for you. And you pray for yourselves as we close in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord, for Stephen, this great saint we're going to meet one day. Lord, we thank you for Philip, too, this great saint that we're going to meet someday and as we worship you. And Lord, we thank you that you show us these things in your word that we too might not just look back and say, wow, well, that was great or that was interesting. But Lord, that you too might continue to speak to us through your word and that your Holy Spirit, who is God and who is the same yesterday, today and forever, would continue to do your work in us and through us, transforming us, gripping our hearts, gripping our lives, breaking down barriers, opening our eyes to see people that you see and those that you love and those that you want to reach, that we too may be your hands to do your work, your feet to go, your heart to express love, your voice to speak. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless